It was one of the most famous musical marriages in history, resulting in the sales of millions of records, breaking down racial barriers, and winning over fans across the world. However, the one-time relationship of Tina Turner and her first husband, Ike Turner, was marked with violence and abuse. Before this tragic nearly 20-year relationship left Tina, who recently passed at the age of 83, physically, emotionally, and financially broken, the one-time couple owns a famous home in Los Angeles. Located in the View Park neighborhood, Tina and Ike's former residence was once a retro piece of history, but more recently it was turned into a modern mid-century home. The ranch-style property was built in 1956, featuring just under 3,000 square feet of space, and it was also used as Tina and Ike's home in the 1993 film What's Love Got to Do With It, about Tina's rise to fame and her tumultuous relationship with Ike. Before his death in 2007, it's said that the last place Ike Turner called home was his modest property in San Marcos, California, which is also where he passed away. The home which Ike Turner once lived with his wife Tina Turner for over a decade had quite the facelift in recent years, turning the 1956 built retro property into a modern mid-century residence. Located in the View Park neighborhood of Los Angeles, this ranch-style home spanned 2,964 square feet of space and came equipped with four bedrooms and five baths throughout. Not only was the home the actual place where Ike and Tina lived for many years. It also played the couple's home in the 1993 film What's Love Got to Do With It, about Tina's rise to fame, rocky personal life. While many facts in that movie were reportedly fake, at least the main filming location was true to reality. Ike purchased this property, situated on just under a quarter of an acre of land, in 1964, after he got a 40k bonus for signing a contract with Sue Records. Reports claim that Ike spent $100,000 for the residence back then, while in today's day that would equate to nearly $900,000. The couple called this View Park property home until Tina moved out after leaving Ike in 1976, when Ike then sold it, fully furnished the next year for 115 k Those buyers kept the home, even with the super retro decorations for almost four decades and changed basically nothing about the pad. So when it came time to shoot the film, this house was an easy pick to make use of. Both the inside and outside of the house was featured plenty throughout the movie. Apparently, it was Ike's idea on how to design these retro and interesting interiors as he redecorated in 1970 while Tina was in the hospital. It was written in a biography about her life. When she was finally released, she went home to a real shocker. Instead of having spent money on flowers to send to Tina, she found that he had spent a small fortune on completely redecorating their house from floor to ceiling in super fly, ghetto, or house chic style. Ike added a wet bar with a built-in fish tank, mirrored ceilings, a coffee table shaped like a guitar, and a blue velvet couch with arms that turned into octopus tentacles, if you could believe it. In the living room, he also had a floor-to-ceiling rock waterfall installed in the corner. Some features of the home remain to this day, but not those ones, including the ornate front doors that were actually custom-made for Tina, with door handles shaped like arms and hands in a Buddhist style. Another thing that actually stayed from Ike and Tina's days of living here was also the Fieldstone fireplace and entry wall. While many of these strange home amenities could be seen in the 1993 film, one thing that was fake was Ike's at-home recording studio because in reality, he rented a studio in a private apartment, not on the premises. One thing that certainly was revamped was the formerly not so pretty kitchen. Tina has been quoted saying about this one time green colored cooking space, Ike thought I'd be happy because yeah, I did like green, but not necessarily in my kitchen. In that way, everything had been done first class, custom made at the house. I mean, it cost a fortune, but it was poor taste. Well, the late Tina would be happy to see that the kitchen was completely refreshed and after renovations, all the cabinets and appliances were traded in for white and stainless steel amenities. The small doorway that opened to the living room was also fully opened up to give the area an airy and spacious feel. Out back, the pool area of the home remains largely the same, and aside from the custom swimming pool, there's also a cabana and fire pit lounge area on the property. As shown in What's Love Got to Do With It, Tina's time living here with Ike wasn't what you call bliss. She spoke about the abuse she endured at this property and elsewhere on many occasions, one time saying in 1981, my ex-husband was a physically violent man. I went through basic torture. I was living a life of death. I didn't exist, but I survived it. And when I walked out, I walked and I didn't look back. And after she ditched Ike for good, Tina did find her own power and happiness, going on to win a ton of awards and record hit songs, 
as well as finding love again with her next husband, Erwin Bach. As for this property, following the huge remodel, it last sold in 2018 for just under $1.4 million. Looking back on what happened to finally end the cycle between Ike and Tina Turner, the moment she left wasn't until 1976. When the star escaped her abusive husband, it had been building up for years, and Ike, the musician and band leader, had built an act around his wife. In his mind, he was the one who made Tina a star. The control that Ike had over Tina's life was immense and made it nearly impossible for her to prepare her exit. Meaning, when she did leave, she only had 36 cents and one credit card in her pocket. When Ike and Tina met in 1957, she was still Anna Mae Bullock, a 16-year-old country girl from a small town in Tennessee, while Ike was in his mid-twenties an already polished band leader and rising star. Tina impressed him enough with her unique singing voice that he added her to his band as Little Anne. There was no romance between the two in the first few years, and instead Tina was in a relationship with the band's saxophone player and fell pregnant with his child, giving birth to her first son in 1958 just after graduating high school. Eventually, Ike would reorganize the band around Tina, and in 1960 he renamed them the Ike and Tina Turner Review, while well, they had already started a romantic relationship. They even had a son together that same year, but they weren't legally married until a quick Tijuana wedding in 1962. Tina later said, I knew that I didn't want to marry him, didn't want to be a part of his life, didn't want to be another of the 500 women he had around him by then. But I was, well, I was scared, and by now this was my life. Where else could I go? For a decade, Tina Turner lived a life that was a whirlwind of fame, performing, abuse, and drug use, which all centered around Ike. Where on stage, she was full of energy, sexy and strong. Off stage, she was an exhausted mom struggling to control Ike's rages and meet his demands. Years after, Ike would deny the extent of the abuse to Tina, stating, sure, I slapped Tina, we had fights, and there had been times when I punched her without thinking, but I never beat her. In 1972, a few things happened that got Tina on her way out. She talked back to Ike for the first time, and by then she was raising the kids, writing the songs, and paying the bills. She also found Buddhism and began chanting a mantra regularly. The more she chanted, the more she noticed her life improving. Tina was offered an acting role in the rock musical Tommy and filmed a TV special with Anne Margaret. Being on set gave her time away from Ike and a peek at how capable she really could be without him. Finally, on July 1st, 1976, Tina saw her chance. On a flight to Dallas to begin their next tour, the two began to fight, and in the car on the way to their Hilton hotel, Ike began slapping her. She remembered later she hit him back, kicked, and cursed, which is when she admitted she knew she was gone. As she freed herself from an abusive relationship, the planned review tour Tina had coming up failed, and the promoters and advertisers wanted her to pay. She began booking appearances on game shows such as Hollywood Squares, anything that would generate cash flow, and Ike wasn't giving an inch in divorce proceedings. Because he had copyrighted her name, he wanted to take that too. Eventually, she decided against her lawyer's advice to let him have just about everything. The house, cars, the recording studio, in exchange for her professional name, Tina Turner. The divorce was finalized in 1978. Tina had no money, no bands, and no record label. And she didn't know that it would be six years before she would release the album Private Dancer, the biggest hit of her career. In her future also lay a happy marriage, Grammy Awards, and induction into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame as a solo artist and much more. But Tina had already proved to herself that Ike hadn't made her a star and whatever lay ahead, they would be her best days. While we know that Tina Turner went on to have the best days of her career after leaving Ike before her 2023 passing at age 83, what became of her ex-husband? Reportedly, the final home of Ike Turner was located in San Marcos, California, where he also died. There aren't many photos online of Ike Turner's home aside from areas and exterior shots, but what we do know about the residence is that it spanned a modest 1,604 square feet of space and featured three bedrooms and two bathrooms throughout. He passed away in this North County home in 2007 when he was 76. While Ike was once a groundbreaking guitarist, pianist, his reputation was tarnished by his drug addiction, stint in prison, and of course, because of the abuse he inflicted on his ex-wife, Tina. The cause of Ike's death hadn't been determined, but foul play wasn't suspected. Ike Turner's ex-wife and manager, Ann Thomas, was the last to see him alive in his bedroom just after 8 a.m. the day he passed. 
With the band members in the house ready to play some music to cheer him up, she delivered the news that he wasn't breathing. Band members tried unsuccessfully to revive him before paramedics arrived. Either way, Ike Turner's action in his marriage to Tina Turner resulted in the downfall of his reputation. While that story of the two late musicians in one time couple is a long and complicated one to tell, for today that will bring this house tour to a close. Before we go, answer this question for me. If you bought a retro Hollywood home like Tina and Ike Turner's former spot, what's one strange amenity you might keep? I might have chosen the wet bar with built-in fish tank, but let me know your choice in the comments below. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and follow me on Instagram to chat. I'm Kara the Vampire Slayer, and if you'd like to check out more homes before you go, then stay tuned, because next, we'll look at the properties of someone with a more positive legacy, Stevie Wonder. Bye. After making a successful career in music, Stevie Wonder has lived in plenty of beautiful homes from the East to the West Coast since his days growing up in Detroit. It's reported that these days, he and his wife live in the luxury Bel Air Crest neighborhood in Los Angeles, but he's also formerly lived in a Los Feliz mansion and one in Beverly Hills, just to name a couple. Today, we'll take a look at a few of Stevie's homes we even found the listings. In these videos, we don't reveal any addresses, and even though I've done a house tour of my own place, please do not show up at any private residence because it's not safe for anyone. It's unlikely that you don't know who Stevie Wonder is, as he's a music legend. The singer, songwriter, musician, and more was a well-known figure in music during the second half of the 20th century, and one of the most successful. Stevie is essentially a one-man band, and his use of electronic instruments in the 70s helped reshape R&B. He's been credited as a major influence to many musicians over the years of different genres, from pop to gospel to rhythm and blues, and more. Stevie was blind since shortly after birth and became a child prodigy known as Little Stevie Wonder, signing to a record label at the young age of 11. In fact, one of his tunes was number one when he was only 13, making him the youngest ever to top the charts. His peak of success came in the 1970s, and then he began a classic period with his music. Stevie has sold over 100 million records worldwide, making him one of the best-selling artists ever, and has also won 22 Grammy Awards, among plenty other awards and accolades. At the time of this recording, Stevie has amassed himself an estimated net worth of about $110 million and has invested in lavish real estate throughout his life. His hometown is Detroit, Michigan, but these days he's made his main home in none other than Los Angeles. It's said he lives with his wife Tamika Robin Bracey in the exclusive Bel Air Crest neighborhood of LA where he's next door neighbors with Gordon Ramsay. Hey guys, it's Kara the Vampire Slayer and I'm bringing you another house tour here on Famous Entertainment. I noticed a bunch Bunch of you guys watching our videos aren't subscribed, so be sure to hit that subscribe button to ring that bell and help us get to a million subscribers. We post a new video daily. Today we're gonna take a look at where Stevie Wonder calls home, including a gorgeous mansion in Los Feliz he used to live at and more. The icon has owned mansions from multiple properties in LA to Alpine, New Jersey, so it's clear he likes to invest in real estate. If you like this video, we've reported on the homes of other music legends like Ray Charles and Prince, which we'll link to at the end. As always, don't forget to follow me over on Instagram to chat, and now let's get into this video. Like I mentioned, Stevie's hometown is Detroit, Michigan, and when he was a child, he lived on Hastings Street. These days, the house on the property has been described in listing materials as a charming ranch home and has been renovated and upgraded all around. This house sits on an acre of land and spans just over 1,000 square feet inside, but it looks like a really nice family home. Then, as a teen, Stevie was still living in Detroit, this time in a Tudor-style home on Green Lawn Street. But this home has since been torn down. After Stevie found continued success the music industry, he eventually put down some roots in Los Angeles. He's owned multiple properties in the area and apparently still does, including one in Woodland Hills, his current home, and more. At one point, the musician lived in this beautiful Los Feliz mansion, which we'll take a look at. Back in 2008, Stevie decided to put this house on the market for $3.2 million, and in more recent years, the gorgeous abode has gone up for sale again with a much steeper price tag of over $8 million. While Stevie purchased the home, many 
many, many years back from your 435K, he sold it for about $2.4 million. The home has been completely reimagined since, considering Stevie bought it way back in the 70s and held on to it for about 30 years. It was in need of an upgrade. Situated on a lot spanning almost half an acre of land, the mansion is described as a 1920 Mediterranean house with an Art Deco period design. Located in Los Feliz, this neighborhood is a relaxed hillside enclave that borders Griffith Park and the Griffith Observatory. In recent years, the neighborhood has become trendier, with both creative and famous people choosing to call Los Feliz home. Considering how desirable the area is and how the mansion looks now after being completely upgraded, it's no wonder the price tag jumped up by millions of dollars. Stevie's former mansion spans 4,511 square feet inside with seven beds, seven baths, and 14 rooms in total, including a beautiful pool house out back. Nearly everything was changed inside this house. They said goodbye to features like a tiki bar, replacing it with a fancier marble bar. The mansion is located behind large wooden gates for privacy, and it overlooks downtown LA right to beautiful ocean views. Walking into the villa, there's a dramatic double staircase in a rotunda style entry with sparkling chandelier overhead and skylights. The hardwood floors below also lead down a few steps to a common space with wall of windows and a cute European style terrace. A living room here has arched glass doors, vaulted wooden ceilings, and a fireplace. There are multi-level terraces across the mansion and most common spaces have doors to these spaces. Stevie's former mansion has been transformed to include a massive kitchen with all the newest and priciest appliances, including a huge fridge, and there's also a casual eating space with more doors out to a covered terrace. On the lower level of the home, there's a solarium style room that's all walls of windows, which has a lounge space and bar and walks out to the backyard. Additional features in Stevie's former mansion include a basement floor that listing materials claim was turned into a theater room. There is also a separate guest house cabana with its own bedroom and bath. Outside, of course, there's a luxury sparkling pool and spa set within a grassy lawn surrounded by patios. Just last year, another home that Stevie used to live at came up on the market, this time located in the coveted Truesdale Estates neighborhood. Stevie lived here from 2011 to 2015, but it's said that he was leasing the home instead of owning it, and most recently, this pad sold for a whopping $10.5 million. This shouldn't come as a surprise though, considering the average home price in this posh neighborhood is over over $11 million. Truesdale Estates is located in the foothills of the Santa Monica Mountains and home to a long list of high profile celebrities from Eva Longoria to Elton John and many more. The community was developed in the 1950s and 60s and is a highly private part of Beverly Hills. Stevie's former home here was set high up on a lot overlooking views of the hills and city lights and the Hollywood Regency style abode was a single level. Still, interior space has spanned over 6,000 200 square feet, offering up four beds and eight baths throughout. The entire home, or most of it, boasted expanses of windows, especially along the back, that offered views towards Century City, while on a clear day you can even see the ocean. The secure and gated grounds span half an acre of land, and there's plenty of patio space and areas to dine and entertain here. Not to mention there's the requisite swimming pool, which also offers amazing views. Other features include a four-car underground garage, which is accessed through the front entry. Before it was listed in 2020, Stevie's former home was up on the market in 2006 for $4.9 million and last sold in 2015 for $6.4 million, a fair amount less than it's worth now. In terms of being up for rent, the property was priced as high as $21K per month in 2015, which would have been just after Stevie moved on from the place. My guess is that's around how much he was paying to live here. While we know that Stevie lived in and owned a handful of desirable properties in the Los Angeles area, like the two we just looked at. These days, it's said he settled down in Bel Air Crest. While information on this home is kept really private, Stevie and his wife are reportedly next door neighbors to celebrity chef Gordon Ramsay here. Bel Air Crest is an exclusive 24 hour guard gated community nestled in the Bel Air neighborhood of Los Angeles. It's described as a resort style subdivision with about 200 homes or mansions, if you will, that have an average price of $10 million. Here, properties boast views of the canyons and hills, and luxury mansions are private and secure. 
manicure. The neighborhood is one of the most prestigious in the area, so it's no doubt that Stevie chose to call this place home. All right, so now we've taken a look at a couple of the homes Stevie Wonder has called home, so I think I'll wrap up this house tour here. After checking out two of his former properties, including the beautiful mansion in Los Feliz he sold in 2008, and his lavish Truesdale Estates rental, what did you guys think? I mean, we even saw his charming childhood home in Detroit, which you can compare to. Even that home, though it was modest in size, was charming. I absolutely loved the first mansion we looked at, especially how it was renovated in recent years. While the space is sprawling, there are still cozy rooms to make it feel like a home. I think my favorite parts of this mansion were the sunroom with walls of windows, and of course, the pool. Be sure to tell me what you liked or didn't like about Stevie's homes in the comments down below. If you haven't, go subscribe to my personal channel because I would love to get to know all of you better. We'll link you my latest video. All right, all right, all right. Oh my gosh. I'm gonna start talking about David Berkowitz. So, like I said, David Ber Thanks for tuning in. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram to chat and I will see you all in the next video. Bye.